Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining CGS CIMB and myself on a Wednesday to learn a bit more a, about Vietnam and the exciting opportunities that this Southeast Asian country can offer investors. So what we're going to cover today is really a bit more about the macro side of the Vietnam story, how we feel, ex how excited we are about the story and how I think investors should really be positioned for this, for, for the growth story. And then my colleague Jake is also going to run us through a bit more about the growth outlook and also the best way to play this at the moment, which we feel is the CGS full goal Vietnam 30 sector cap ETF. So before we get started and before we get into any of the particulars of the growth story, I thought I'd just give a quick intro to myself. Some of you may have seen me around before. I'm currently head of investment advisor with the investment management unit at CGS. I'm really looking at trying to develop, implement, manage the uh, investment strategy in line with the firm's overall goals. Got previous experience with Schroeder's and the Molly Four, and I've really got a more global perspective about about the equity market and the growth markets out there. Um, and my colleague, Jake, is currently the lead portfolio manager for our wealth and investment management unit. Um, he's really got a very strong background in the quantitative side of research, and is also really a fervent advocate for systematic strategies and really having a plan of, you know, on the long-term side, as well as on the technical and fundamental side. Um, so before that, I would like to remind listeners and the audience just to show us any questions you might have throughout this presentation. Just scan the QR code there or go to pigeonhole.at and enter the passcode, which is just today's date, 16th uh, AUG, 2023. From there, you'll be able to post any questions that you want uh, anonymously or if you want to, to put your name, you can and we will get to them at the end. So we'll try not to be too long with the presentation. And if we have questions, we'll try to address everything uh, that we possibly can within the hour. Okay, so I'm gonna start off really with the outlook and the economy in Vietnam and the market opportunities that we really see in, in, in Vietnam at this current point in time. We all know how strong the economic and GDP growth story in Vietnam is. Um, I mean, we've really had that be bombarded with it really over the past sort of decade. It's been one of the best performers uh, in Asia since 2000. So actually outside of China, it's had the best average GDP growth over the past two decades. It's averaged about 6.2% um, over the past 20 years or the past 23 years from 2000. And so it's been really the best performing economy in Asia, except for China, large economy for, except for China. And this has really been a result of the opening up process from 1990, really starting out to really open up to, to businesses and to private enterprise. Um, and real GDP is, uh, has been also very impressive. And it's been one of the most consistent. I think that's the key that we want to stress is consistent growers in the Asian markets, right? So in up and down markets, it's very, been a very consistent grower of the econ its economy. Um, its people have gotten richer as well over time. And this is something that I think is going to be very valuable in the next decade ahead. We've seen the economy experience a really strong rebound in 2022 from obviously a very, very strong, uh, a very big dip in 2020, 2021 with, with pandemic measures, which I think everyone or globally, all countries were really faced with. Um, but it's, it's going to maybe moderate a bit more this year, but it's still gonna be very strong in Asia in terms of its growth, in terms of its growth number. Uh, in terms of the sector split, we've got a bit more of the agriculture industry and services sector contributing various uh, proportions, but services are a very strong part of that. So I think that's something that we should focus on as a potential growth engine for uh, for the country in, in the decade ahead, given how rich or how, sorry, how prosperous the country is becoming. It's not a rich country by any means at this stretch at this point in time, but the potential for it to upgrade its industrial infrastructure, um, you know, in terms of like building out, in terms of building out. Uh, road networks, rail networks, all that, I think that investment is going to continue to flow. And growth is expected to pick up back to 6.5% in 2024. Um, as you can see with the economies uh, of Vietnam's main export markets continue to gain strength. When we talk about the rise of the young workforce, this is the demographic dividend, I think, which is, is really the term that a lot of economists and investors use, is really you want 
it to be more of a pyramid shape, right? You want there to be at the bottom younger people coming in and starting to uh, having a young population that's also educated and then starting to go into the workforce. And that can hopefully spur productivity growth. That can also hopefully spur economic growth. And so it's got one of the youngest populations in Southeast Asia. And at the moment, it's currently projected to reach um, around 101 million by 2030, uh, which would be about 7% growth from 2020. But it's already edging towards it's already edging towards that hundred million mark um, today as it stands, and so I think the rise of the young workforce is something that's really exciting. I would add also in that context that the schooling system in Vietnam is also one of the most well regarded and well respected in terms of the um, in terms of school scores and and its quality, right? So there are independent studies from the World Bank that rate Vietnam as better or if, if, you know, better than countries that are six times richer, like Britain or Canada. So their schooling system for primary and secondary is, is very strong. There could be a bit more done, I think, on the university tertiary um, technical sides, but the, the schooling system is also, a, they're very strong performers, uh, the students in Vietnam. So that's a, that's a great thing for potential future growth in terms of productivity in the workforce. And as you can see, the labor force versus the population since 2000, you know, as a young, as a young structure, working age population is expected to continue to grow steadily. And again, I think this is really in line with what I was saying earlier about consistent growth. And this is coming through again with the demographics, the consistency in that growth uh, projections in terms of the, in terms of the, the workforce and in terms of how educated they are. I think that's really going to help with, um, with the labor costs of, that are the advantage of lower labor costs, which it currently has. And that's feeding through into labor intensive industries such as textiles and clothing, um, which are continuing to migrate. And as we've seen recently with some of these more high end uh, electronic manufacturers, they're really starting to move up the value chain that are relocating from maybe more expensive labor in China uh, into Southeast Asia and particularly into Vietnam. And we see really significant growth in the, in the stock market as well, right? I mean, currently it's classified as a frontier market. So there's frontier and there's emerging. Emerging is, is, is a bit more developed. Frontier is a bit more on, on the, uh, you know, on earlier on in the development phase, I would say. Um, but the stock market really has demonstrated a robust performance as well. It had a really big run up, as you can see on the left, uh, given, given COVID. But over time, it has also done extremely well. Um, it's come back down. Market stabilized this year, um, but I think there's still a lot of potential future growth given how valuations have adjusted and really come back down to a bit more reasonable, uh, a reasonable level given how, how fast it had run up during the pandemic as well. So we look at the real estate industry, um, it's expecting rapid growth as well due to the huge room for development in, in, the, in the big cities. And you've got Ho Chi Minh, Hanoi, and you've got other tier two cities as well starting to grow. A lot more, and there's really a, a a need for this type of development and this type of of this type of housing as well in uh, in Vietnam. As you can see, projected urbanization rates in Vietnam are still relatively low. If we think about how far China has come, looking at around 64, 65 to 70 percent, you know, Vietnam's only at around 39, 40 percent. So it's still a lot further behind, and the global average is around 50 percent in terms of urbanization. And we all know as soon as people move from the countryside into more productive roles in cities, they become more affluent, they have more disposable income, and they're going to start to spend more as well as consumers. So I think these are some of the key factors that we've got to watch out for as well as some maybe the transfer of land use rights that's laid the foundation for some market oriented approaches to to releasing some of this um, demand for real estate that there is there there is given how many people are starting to go towards cities and starting to migrate to cities as well okay i'm gonna really pivot a little bit and just talk about the promising market that we think vietnam is you know in terms of its uh in terms of its position in southeast asia and where we see the growth drivers, right? And we really think agriculture, I think will be one of the primary industries in Vietnam. It's traditionally a very agricultural country. And as I said, around rural population is accounting for about 60% of the total. So you've got 40% in cities and 60% really looking at the agricultural side of, of things. And the innovations that are to come, you know, to maintain that position and to grow the industry in Vietnam will continue. And if we think about agriculture more generally, it's still 
stuck in perhaps the pre-tech age or it's not really moved on. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for the agriculture industry to really innovate, uh, to grow yields and to, to think about um, to think about innovation in, in the agricultural sense in terms of some of the crops that they're growing. They're a big exporter of rice as well, as we know, we've been in Southeast Asia. And so I think this is an opportunity for the country to, to really take a lead in that space. And these land reform policies have really sort of tried to address that issue of self-sufficiency in food. Um, and it's also allowed people to be into, entered into the industrial workforce. And we've kind of seen the focus in a lot of Asia about self-sufficiency. We've seen that in China with some of their reforms about focusing on self-sufficiency for food. We've seen that in India recently where they banned the export of rice to focus on domestic demand. And that's that's really taken a hit to the rice price, or that's really boosted the rice price, rather, I would say, but it's also distorted the rice market. So these types of issues, I think, in in, in a world which is increasingly becoming more focused on uh, energy security, food security, I think these are issues that that Vietnam will have a uh, will have a leg up or an advantage in. And then we've got manufacturing, right? I mean, policy ha has really been very supportive, but I think Vietnam has also been a very fortunate country in terms of where it stands today, in terms of its workforce, in terms of its educated workforce, but also in terms of the geopolitical situation, which they've really benefited from. If you think about some of the larger electronic manufacturers that are US based or US listed, and they've moved a lot of some of their supply down to, to Vietnam. I don't think any country or any one country in Southeast Asia or even in the broader Asia region will replace China. It's just there's that thought among US companies, among Western companies about thinking about diversifying supply chains. So it's really just about, even if Vietnam takes one, two, three percent of that, it's going to be a massive boost for the uh, for the economy. And we've got the ports that are all supporting global logistics as well. Um, we have a coastline in, in Vietnam that's over 3000 kilometers long. So the country is really in a great geological geographic position rather to take advantage of trade right and if we've got more trade coming through in asia then vietnam naturally is probably going to be one of the the key points of um, that are going to benefit one of the key countries that will benefit and we've got two key ports in haiphong and then in ho chi minh um, these have very strong uh very strong logistics and uh infrastructure behind them and I think they will probably continue to grow uh, well into the future as, as trade picks up and as, as exports perhaps pick up into next year as well. And labor and land is low low costs. We think that's great as, as it, companies and as corporates think about relocating there, taking advantage of cheaper labor. Um, we've seen that, as I've said, with, with more expensive labor, it starts to migrate, whether that's to Vietnam, whether that's to Sri Lanka, perhaps clothing or textiles. There are going to be countries in the region that will benefit from the relocation of, of manufacturing. And Vietnam is going to be one of the key, key winners in that space. GDP per capita, I mean, if we're thinking about the actual growth potential, you want to be earlier on the curve, right? You want it to be at a relatively low economic development, but with all the right ingredients, such as educated, skilled workforce, a uh, bit more advanced manufacturing and starting to move up the supply chain or the value chain, rather. And they've really got that cost advantage in terms of their per capita GDP, right? It's, it's not relatively high versus other countries and other neighbors in, in Southeast Asia, um, but that's combined with the rapid growth in the workforce and also growth in the overall economy. So this is all really coming together, I think, in a, a perhaps a um, prosperous flywheel effect for, uh, for the country. And tech progresses, you know, the foreign direct investment is going to continue to grow. I think we've already seen that they're on the right side of the of the the current situation geopolitically. They're on the right side of the flows as well in terms of foreign direct investment. And for for Vietnam, I think the outlook is is looking very favorable for the next five to ten years. And the government has continued to release and revise policies around foreign capital, so that's going to be positive for foreign investors. I think if you are a frontier market or if you're looking to go upgrade to an emerging eventually, you're going to want to continue to reform. You're going to want to continue to open capital markets. And so Vietnam really does have an incentive to continue to open up to the outside world, improve its infrastructure, um, its attractiveness to, to foreign investors as well. 
And so as we see if DI's like total registered capital here, it's um, a lot of it in manufacturing, but there's also some real estate. And so there's a lot of opportunity for, for growth in, in other areas as well. We've kind of seen with Thailand taking the lead, maybe perhaps in some of their solar panels and green energy, there's also an opportunity for, for Vietnam to, to, uh, to also benefit from the whole uh, clean energy transition and solar panel uh, distribution or solar panel manufacturing rather in Southeast Asia. And then we move on to the financial sector, the centralized credit, uh, regulated regulated currency. So that is one uh, perhaps hurdle for investors currently at this point is that the uh, the Vietnamese dong is is a controlled currency. Um, but the banking sector has really maintained a fast pace of credit expansion. Um, and in a, in that sense, it's maybe perhaps similar to a, to a India, where India the demand for credit and the demand for credit growth is 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 extremely high. So the banking sector in Vietnam's is serving is serving a, a population base which is in dire need of uh, domestic credit as well. So the currency stability is really quite an important part of the objective of monetary policy in Vietnam. They're looking for a fixed uh, you know effort rate before opening up in 1986. It was fixed. Um, it's perhaps being stabilized now, but it's really controlled within a band. So there really isn't a lot of movement on. Um, it, it's a managed flow regime with the with the daily reference rate for the VN, the Vietnamese dong uh, set against the U.S. dollar the greenback. And so, for summary, I think you know the approach of the experiences of China and Japan and Korea and these regional neighbors um, that didn't really implement free trade and deregulation. Um, you know, I think it's an important part of the approach for Vietnam to think about how they want to, how much of a role the government wants to play and where they can really make an impact positively on the growth of certain sectors. And so the core competitiveness of Vietnam really is, is really fourfold. We've got the robust economic growth and the population dividend, which is key. The urbanization benefits a real estate sector, that urbanization, that consumer spending also moving to the cities the significant growth potential for the stock market as it moves or tries to get more open to foreign investors in the frontier market space and hopefully move up the, the, the curve of the emer into emerging market later. And then finally, the young, really educated workforce that is favored in manufacturing and perhaps started in more low-end textiles, but has started to move up the value chain into higher-end electronics. So I'm just going to pass it over here now to my colleague, Jake, and Jake will take us through the rapid growth potential, the outlook um, over the short term and the short one to three year outlook, and then also go through the specifics of the CGS full goal uh, sector cap Vietnam ETF. So please, Jake, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Um, so Jake will be sharing his, his deck and I will... Uh, I will stop sharing mine. There we go. Right. Uh, thanks, Tim, for uh, taking us through the prospects in Vietnam. And of course, uh, my first point to share with everyone would be our three-year outlook uh, for Vietnam. So the economic outlook between 2023 to 2026, um, it's a rapid economic expansion with the growth, GDP growth forecast to grow at a pace of around 6.5% in 2023. And we're expecting a sustained strong growth at a pace of around 67 to 68 percent per year uh, from 2024 to 2026 over the next three years. So with the strong economic expansion projected over the next decade, uh, Vietnam's total GDP forecast is forecast to increase from 327 billion in 2022 to 470 billion in, by 2025. And we are expecting it to raise to 70, uh, sorry, 7, 760 billion by the year 2020. 2030. So this translates to very rapid growth in terms of um, per capita, um, GDP per capita. So that's roughly from 3,003 per year uh, to 4,007 per year by year 
uh, by the year of 2025. And by the year of 2030, we should be expecting USD 7,400 by then. And that is a very substantial expansion in terms of its um, uh, do domestic consumer market. And of course, uh, Vietnam's role as a low cost manufacturing hub is also expected to grow very strongly. And this is helped by the further expansion of its existing major industry sectors. And that's notably in the textile and electronic segment, as well as the development for new industry sectors such as autos and petrochemicals. And Vietnam it really has a very strong domestic uh, automaker, electric automaker in VinFast, uh, which was launched in 2021. Yeah, so in March last year, VinFast actually announced a US $2 billion investment to build a plant in North Carolina. And that's for manufacturing EV buses and SUVs, as well as uh, EV battery manufacturing, with the construction commencing this year. And for many multinationals worldwide, significant supply chain vulnerability vulnerabilities have been exposed by the protracted disruption of the industrial production of, in China, as well as some of the major uh, manufacturing hubs around the world, especially during the COVID-19 lockdowns. So this will drive the further reshaping of the manufacturing supply chain over the medium term, as firms try to reduce their vulnerability to such extreme supply chain disruptions. And with the US-China trade and technology tensions remaining high, so we expect this to be a further driver for reconfiguring, reconfiguring of uh, supply chains. And of course, the key beneficiary of this shift in the global manufacturing supply chain will be in the ASEAN region, with Vietnam expected to be one of the main winners. And enough of this uh, expected outlook, I would like to take everyone through some real numbers. Um, although historical, but this is one okay. of the key. Oh, sorry, Jay, yeah, you, you, your thing wasn't moving before. I'm just wanting to make sure that you're, uh, you, weren't, you weren't displaying slides before. It was stuck on your holding. Um, uh, is it? Uh, you're, yeah, okay, so you, you're, you're displaying it now, right? Okay. Correct, I, I have no, no yeah, I've got no charts for that. Okay. I just just wanted to confirm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so on the left um, is a diagram. Uh, I've, I've intentionally left out the, the names of indices, uh, but basically it has um, it has the six major markets that we're looking at uh, in terms of EPS growth. So this is a monthly chart over the past 10 years. Um, Actually, what I've do, what I've done is I rebase it to hundred. Um, so that it, it gives everyone the visual uh, analytics to see which country, which countries or which markets are growing their earnings from a broad market perspective in a very um, smooth or very volatile um, way. And essentially, what you see over here is uh, Japan, South Korea. Taiwan, Vietnam, China, and Hong Kong. So I, I just want everyone to take a mental picture of this um, diagram, chart, whatever you want to call it. Right, so um, give a mental vote on which market you think gives you the smoothest um, growth in terms of EPS. And this is the chart with the legend. Um, essentially, I'm not making this up. Um, we have uh, the green color line, which you see is the strongest over the past 10 years. And I, I believe everyone would have guessed it is Taiwan. All right, so yes, Taiwan has the strongest EPS growth over the past 10 years amongst the six countries. Now, but of course it comes with a lot of volatility as well especially over the past three years, if you look at the diagram. And second is, second in place is Japan, 
um, the Topix actually has the best, second best EPS growth. Uh, but if, if, if you notice, it tends to have lesser volatility than Taiwan, especially over the past few years. It was more volatile between 2017 to 2020, uh, 2017 to 2020. Uh, but over the past three years, it tends to be a bit smoother. And the third place is actually Vietnam, right? So the VN index, uh, which has about 330 odd names, uh, that's a good representation of broad market, uh, came in third place. And that's the, the green line, the aqua line over here, right? So um, the fourth is CSI 300, China. Uh, the fifth is actually South Korea, right? You see, you can see that it has very strong growth, but very, very choppy, very volatile. And of course, uh, the last in place is Hong Kong, uh, the HSI index. You can see basically this um, yellow line, it's almost flat, right? Um, you can see this is one of the key drivers for um, equity equity returns, especially um, if let's say all the things we, we spoke about earlier in the session, all the economic growth expectations translating into earnings, into sales, right? So these are the key things that uh, professional investors uh, or fund managers pay attention to, right? Because earnings is the bloodline of, of the corporate growth. Without sales, without earnings growth, there's nothing much to talk about. And this particular model I'd like to share with everyone, it's uh, what I call the relative strength and relative valuation model. So it look, it look at two different aspects of the fundamentals and the technicals of a broad market, whether it's a regional index, single country index, the sector, or you can, you can apply it simply at the single stock level. Right, what this model or this chart is showing you is basically how uh, Vietnam fares in terms of its um, momentum and at the same time its valuations. And for valuations, I'm using very simple stuff like your price to earnings and price to book, uh, which is in your second and third segment over here. Yes, yes. Um, okay, I this up. But um, essentially what you're saying over here is uh, when the market is topish, you can see the valuations are actually at extreme levels. Um, the prior to climax or market peaks of the Vietnam index, you can see that at its peak in 2018, and 2021, the valuations are very, very stretched. Um, when it's trailing 12 months, earnings are trading above 20 times P, right? So when the when the valuations are overstretched, it is usually not sustainable. You can, you, you'll find that the momentum will still persist for a while before it corrects to um, reasonable valuation levels between 15 times earnings, which is, is um, 10 year average, 15 to 16 times earnings, which is over here. Um, roughly, is actually about 16.5 times. So that's the 10 year average for the Vietnamese market. And for price to book, roughly, is about 2.2 times to, uh, to book. So when you're looking at this, at all this fundamental racial matrix, um, at this current juncture, it is not too. Um, it's neither cheap, right, or extremely cheap, but it is at reasonable range. Uh, one of the key things is you want to be involved in the market when it's reasonably cheap, right, and you wouldn't want to um, take new positions or let's say you want to start investing when it's at, um, at the peak of its valuation cycle or at the peak of its momentum cycle as well. So uh, the, the key thing I want to draw everyone's attention to is um, momentum, or some people call it technical analysis, and the fundamentals are actually connected. 
Uh, I totally disagree with people who simply say technical analysis uh, is just looking at price action. But what you're seeing here is the application of quantitative analysis, which, which is actually a sort of branch of technical analysis to, to evaluate the fundamentals so that you can make use of the fundamentals and the technicals to, to come up with a timing model uh, that helps you to decide when to um, retreat, when to advance, when to take a step back and not engage the markets. Right? So as you can see from here, these are the evidence that the markets are at reasonable valuations um, near the 10-year average uh, for its price to earnings. Uh, but below its 10-year average when it comes to price growth, right? Um, the last chart at the bottom is basically uh, the, its earnings trend or its uh, earnings per share trend over the past 10 years. So I like to have it on my on my chart so that I can see that it's growing, right? I I would I would definitely want something that's uh, health that has a healthy momentum in this in in this case. And of course, the, the next biggest question everyone is asking is, yeah, instead of investing in Vietnam, where else can I go? Um, this is also one of the favorite tool that a lot of um, fund managers, especially hedge funds, quantitative funds, uh, one of the techniques that they use very frequently. So it's called relative strength and relative valuation. So more often than not, we have a lot of choices to make, right? So whether you want to overweight, underweight emerging markets, you want to uh, do the same thing for another country, you can actually apply this on single line names as well, right? Let's say you, you're torn between um, investing between Apple and Microsoft, right? So you want to establish which one has got a stronger, compelling technical trend and at the same time, the valuations. So these are the things that we, we use. Um, and I apply this on uh, the Vietnam index against the MSCI emerging markets, which is technically 30% China, right? So I'm not saying that you shouldn't invest in China because its valuations are pretty attractive, but like I showed you earlier, it has um, lesser uh, earnings growth compared to Vietnam. So it's relatively weaker compared to Vietnam in terms of its ability to grow. So therefore, investors will have to weigh um, where they should overweight more in terms of their portfolio uh, allocation. So what you see over here is basically the top, uh, the top segment is the two indices, right? Um, the middle part of it is where we establish it, um, weight has a relative strength over one another. So basically what I do is I take the Vietnam index divided by um, the emerging markets index. And this is where you can establish the relative strength. It's a very simple process. And the third segment is where I, I use statistical analysis to see where the, the extreme levels are. Um, in this case, I'm using price to sales um, because it's very clean. I'm not affected by um, whenever I have a negative earnings number. Yeah, because it happens time, from time to time, certain index or certain companies would have a negative P. So to avoid that, I use price to sales. Yeah, so uh, effectively what this model can derive is it gives you signals. Um, as you can see over here, this rate box indicates time to uh, underweight Vietnam over China. And this green eclipse over here actually tells you it's time to do the opposite, right? So these are um, signals that help investors to decide when to be aggressive, when to be neutral, when to be defensive, when they are evaluating between two investment uh, instruments or investment options, right? So you can see over here, we have actually seen a more recent signal uh, emerging from early 2023, right? So it has gone from a, a more expensive or overvalued scenario in in the end of 2021, and it's actually corrected 
over the This is basically back to equilibrium or what we call mean reversion. And the trend did not break. It continues to move. Uh, therefore, the thesis for any investors out there to overweight Vietnam over emerging markets is still intact. And I would like to share with everyone, uh, when it comes to ETF investing, the most common uh, feedback or complaint that we, we have heard from investors is the lack of liquidity, right? So one of the, one of the key uh, metrics that I would always point out to my colleagues and investors is to look at the implied liquidity, um, which a, a lot of investors are overlooking because they simply look at the, the average trading volume or the average traded value um, whenever they are trying to invest or trade ETFs. So the implied liquidity is basically a matrix that helps us to look at the potential value or volume of the ETF that can be traded without having any market impact. Um, take for example, when you look at the CSO FTSE Vietnam uh, index ETF over here, right? So the average 30 days trading value, uh, trading volume, sorry. Uh, it's around 8,006 uh, shares or units, but in actual fact, it can actually trade up to 12 million uh, shares in a day without actually having market impact, right? So these are some of the things that uh, we need to pay attention to, especially if let's say you are an uh, uh, institutional investor or let's say your family office that, it, that trades in millions. So, yeah, this are never a concern if let's say you look at uh, the implied liquidity, right? So in this case, uh, let's say we look at the alternative option if let's say you, you're considering another uh, Vietnam index ETF, which is the X-Tractors FTSE Vietnam uh, USIT swap ETF. Uh, you can see over here the average um, volume over the last 30 days is 1,965 shares, right? But in actual fact, you can actually trade up to 370,000 shares in a day, right? Without having, having any market impact. And of course, the last um, but not least is the management fees, right? Uh, I want to highlight to everyone that uh, within this space, uh, the ETFs that allow investors to have exposure to Vietnam, uh, it ranges from 0.5% to 0.99%. And the total expense ratio is between 0.5% uh, to 1.8% as well. So these are the sum of, uh, these are some of the cost of ownership uh, fee uh, that investors have to pay attention to. Because uh, if let's say you intentionally pick something that's a little bit too cheap, but yet you're exposing yourself to uh, counter profit risk because of the fact that the ETF uses a swap, then you, you have to make such, or, you have, or rather you have to make the decisions um, which makes more sense for you, right? And of course with this, I would end my, my part of the presentation over here. And of course, if you have any questions, please pose that in the pigeon hole. Uh, back to you, Tim. Thank you, uh, Jake, for that. Um, I think we are ready to take some Q&A, Adrian. Uh, so Adrian, I think we'll share some of the Q&A from investors on Pigeonhole. And hopefully we can get a better sense of uh, what people want to find out about. Sorry, it's my uh, background uh, a bit weird. Okay, so, okay, another thing has gotten an upvote, so I think we can just take it as is. Okay, so the first one, Vietnam is likely to fall into the middle income trap and its innovation is stagnated. High risk for investing in Vietnam. So what difference are ETF for SG investors? We have so many good options. 
So Jake, what's the, the key differentiator of this ETF versus the competitors? Um, there are a couple of them. Um, let me just point out the first one. The first one is actually um, the fact that um, most of the, I've, I've studied most of the in, indices out there that the ETFs are tracking. I would say one of the key differentiating factors um, for the index we're tracking against them is we actually apply a value-based uh, uh, a value-based exclusion screen right at the beginning of the index creation process. So basically what you do find is uh, companies that produces alcohol, defense, drugs, gambling, tobacco will all be eliminated from the, the, the screening process. So within the investment universe, you will not find companies that uh, are in that segment of that industry. Um, of course, the second key feature is this is a physical replication ETF. Uh, unlike the next alternate choice in Singapore, um, if anyone has been paying attention to uh, X-Trackers, it's basically a swap-based ETF. So it's not a physical replication, but of course you can still invest in it. That's not a problem. Uh, but of course, when you're investing in swap-based ETF, you don't own the underlying. And you are just owning a piece of people that uh, is issued to you by the counterparty to say you own this piece of paper. Yeah, so it's something like similar to a CFD or a, a derivative product. Yeah, so this ETF does physical replication. What you own is the underlying. We don't use derivative to gain that exposure. And um, you're, you're quite, or rather you're safeguarded by the fact that you, you, you own the underlying, right? Instead of owning a derivative. And of course, uh, the third feature, it's basically, um, it's not very unusual. I, I studied most of the index providers, they do the, Almost same thing, but perhaps it's a little bit different because uh, Vietnam is a controlled market. So uh, in order to invest in Vietnam, you're subject, or as foreigners, you're subject to uh, the the, uh, the uh, foreign ownership limits. So to account for that, actually, in the, in the algorithm, we have incorporated um, methods to exclude or to account for the foreign limit. So in this case, um, when the index algorithm is constructed, it um, actually exclude or it underweights um, companies that has a very high, uh, sorry, a very low uh, limits at that point in time. Yeah, so uh, that actually gives us a better, better sense and tradability when it comes to um, constructing and navigating how we move into the markets. Um, because at some point, if let's say you never account for that, they, they could be uh, what we call the, uh, the limit. Uh, okay, a proper term for that is the, the hit weight, the hit room limit. Yeah, so when, when we're training the markets, we, we need to account for that. So um, when anyone who does that in the index calculation would avoid uh, running into that kind of scenario where you couldn't get uh, liquidity on, on the names that you want to invest. Now, of course, the next um, differentiating factor between some of the products out there would be uh, we cap single line names to 10%. That means we will not invest in a single line stock uh, at 10% during the point of rebalancing. And also we cap the sector weights to 25%. So this two double layer is to mitigate risk or over concentration in a particular name or a particular sector. And uh, some products have it, some products don't. So we're trying to play some differentiation game here. And I think the last, the last differentiating factor I can think of right now, it's um, this 
ETF that we are we are launching uh, rebalance only twice a year instead of four times a year compared to some of the peers. Of course, not all peers rebalance four times a year. Um, the point of rebalancing twice a year is to reduce the turnover so that we don't incur additional or excessive trading costs. And by doing that, if it doesn't sacrifice performance, it's a good balance to reduce costs and at the same time uh, give you the relevant or the respective uh, returns that you should be uh, getting. Yeah, so uh, I okay. hope that okay. yeah, that helps. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, I think we can move on to the questions. Okay. Um, your ETFs, okay, which country do you think will have a bigger growth, India or Vietnam? Um, I guess I could quickly answer that. Um, I think they're both uh, very strong and very exciting growth stories in their own ways. I think India is a bit more on a different scale just because of the size of the population and also its GDP per capita and its educated workforce and, and things like that. It's got a massive consumer market though. So there's a lot of innovation uh, going on in India, but similarly to, to Vietnam and you know, India's local stock market is a bit more prohibitive to access for anyone who's not an Indian resident or an Indian national um, rather. So it's, it's difficult, but there's that similarity. I think in terms of the bigger growth, they wouldn't, it, it's probably either or like, you know, half six of one or half a dozen of the other. I think if you have exposure to both markets over the next decade, you'll probably do, um, it will probably be a, a relatively uh, supportive growth backdrop, I think, for both countries because they're benefiting in their own ways from the shift uh, or the geopolitical winds and also the shift away from China for manufacturing. So we've kind of seen that with a lot of the manufacturers in the US moving some of their production, Apple, for example, into India, but Apple also has started to make uh, AirPod Pros and, and other products in Vietnam as well. Um, so I think they're both going to benefit in their own ways. I wouldn't say there's got to be just one big winner. Um, that's how I would, I would look at it. Um, next question. Okay, your ETF's tracking index has quite a high concentration in financials and the real estate sectors. Okay, so over 57%. Does this pose a risk, especially in real estate with some of the defaults and the collapse of the Van Tin flat group? Um, so Jake, well, I mean, is there, uh, is there a, a risk in that, in that exposure or that concentration rather? Um, naturally, there'll be risk, but of course, um, the reason why we do sector and single line capping is to mitigate that risk. Um, one of the one of the drawback of the emerging market, like like Vietnam, it's it doesn't it doesn't have that kind of uh, well developed uh, sector, unlike uh, unlike the US. Uh, in fact, if you look at Singapore, it's it's pretty much the same. Singapore doesn't have the, um, at least in the local scene, it doesn't have the kind of well-developed, broad sector-based uh, companies for for the for the investors to do what we call a sector rotation. Yeah. So when it comes to index creation, uh, it, it tends to concentrate into the top three sectors, right? So in this case, uh, no matter what index you look at, whether it's our index whether it's FTSE, MSCI index, you'll find that financials, real estate, and consumer staples dominate the top three. Yeah, so that's the reason and the rationale for us to cap those sector weightings at, right at the beginning, uh, right at the time of rebalancing, so that we, we, fall, we, we don't fall short of getting ourselves caught up in um, overweighting into a particular sector or a particular name. Um, but nonetheless, if let's say the index take into consideration of weighting it based on free fold market cap, um, plus considering the fact that the foreign limit, foreign ownership limit, we will avoid uh, names that are running in trouble because um, a, a lot of people actually happily forgot the fact that market cap weighting or any kind of uh, index weighting or portfolio weighting that has got a market cap factor is actually indirectly exposing itself to momentum factor. 
if a company is run, running into trouble, uh, let's say they are nearing bankruptcy, you'll find that the stock price tend to underperform or do very badly. And when it does that, the index will automatically either underweight or exclude it from consideration or totally be kicked out of the index. So that is a safety mechanism. Uh, if you if you if you consider using market cap weight, so that it's uh, I would say a safety measure. Uh, in in fact, some of the names that got into trouble are being excluded from the index. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. So I, that yeah that helps to to help yeah helps mitigate. Yeah, I guess to a certain extent, it's difficult to avoid these sectors when you're putting together the index, right? It's just I mean. Correct. The competitors, they all have this kind of uh, this kind of exposure just because of the index makeup or the the sort of the economy's makeup. Correct. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's, because, that's, uh, yeah. Let's not forget the fact that we 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 are not full participants of the, the broader market. Like, for example, the four four state on banks, we only have access to one of them. The other three is basically out of reach, out of touch for for foreign investors right now. But of course, that could change if the foreign ownership limit changes because uh, the numbers are not static. It, 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 it is in fact dynamic. Yeah, so we, we can't rule out the fact that at some point when the markets are being more liberal or when yeah. the government is opening up more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, correct. We may be able to have uh, a more active participation. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. Um, next question, we have more questions. Okay, I think this one is similar real estate sector. Um, what's the situation now? There's uh, had done. It's called the real estate sector had done badly due to the government clamping down on credit loans. Um, what is the situation now and going forward? So, Jake, I mean, how, how does the situation on the the that side look for? I guess the macro for the. For uh, the yeah. yeah. In fact, that's one of the most common questions that uh, we get. Mm. Yeah, correct. Um, I, I would say all markets go through boom and bust. Um, the same goes for China, Vietnam, or any any countries that emerging, especially emerging countries or developing mm. countries, uh, because the, the policies and regulations are not as well formulated or developed, unlike the uh, you no know, countries who have been dealing with those problems. Um, naturally, every crisis presents an opportunity. Yeah. If you look back at the historical uh, banking crisis in, in the US, in fact, over the past century, they have more than 100. Oh, sorry, the past two centuries, they have more than 100. Yeah, so um, of course, not every crisis or not every bubble is equal, uh, is equal right? They tend to be a bit more. Uh, wide ranging from more serious like GFC onto mm -hmm. more subtle kind of like bubble or crisis if you want to call it. But nonetheless, it's actually one, uh, it, it's a natural phenomenon that markets actually it's uh, going to self-correct or discount the weaker ones or eliminate the weaker ones and, and let the strongest of, the stronger players survive. Yeah. So yeah, it's a natural mechanism to to bring it back to equilibrium, right? In fact, it's basically what we has what we have studied in in, in school, right? Yeah. Your demand supply distortion, yeah. So you actually at some point you will find that equilibrium. Uh, it's painful, right? The process is always painful, but uh, as investors, we are we are paid to to bear that, that risk. Yeah. yeah. So opportunity amid, yeah. amid crisis, right? There's always going to be right. opportunity. Yeah, perhaps. So there's no free lunch. Um, um, in fact, the market reward us by bearing that risk. Uh, of course, the, the the next question is, what is the risk that that you should bear? Right. So everyone is different. Mm. Um, I, I would say, as as a logical or a, a more quantitative investor, we we'll, we look at the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And um, okay. So next question. 
Okay, Vietnam benefits from the China plus one strategy, but India is gearing up and likely to take up large shares as it has many advantages in workforce for being a democracy, etc. How can Vietnam step up? Um, okay, well, I think again we've got this comparison with India, which I I I fully understand. Uh, it's a very relatable comparison because of maybe their potential rivalries with, with India and India and China and then Vietnam and China and the benefits for India and Vietnam as uh, I guess alternative manufacturing bases to China, the China plus one strategy. I think India is very different in the sense that it is not as educated. The workforce is not as educated. The education system in India is still you know, appalling. I think there's some stats out there about how only half of teachers show up in, in public schools and uh, you know, kids uh, scorings and, and on math, science and, and other uh, basic subjects is still really far down the, the global league tables. So India has a lot to do. Obviously, India is a massive population and there are lots of other areas where it's going to excel. But in terms of the workforce and the educated workforce and, and the, the poverty that's still there and the, the malnutrition and all these other issues that they're having to deal with, it's just such a massive population. There's still a there's still a huge job for India to do to lift that, that population up into more prosperity. So Vietnam is not by any means rich, as I said previously, but it's doing better in terms of its GDP per capita and in terms of its uh, providing for its educated workforce. Um, I'd say one area that both are probably trying to get into is, is solar power in, in terms of renewable energy. Vietnam has really stepped up in terms of producing uh, solar solar power from, from it within Vietnam. Um, so nowadays, I think it went from basically 0% solar power generation as a, as a percentage of electricity generated in 2017. It went up to 11% as of 2021. Um, and as of you know, that year of 2021, it was the world's 10th largest uh, solar producer in the world, Vietnam. So that's one little fact that probably a lot of people aren't aware of. So there are areas where the government is working to deregulate, you know, de, I guess, cut red tape in certain sectors like power, because these are maybe more strategic sectors that are traditionally seen as, as more important to national security or, or you know, that they're, they're favored as, as state-run monopolies in a lot of countries. But Vietnam's shown a willingness to, to reform a few of these areas. The monopoly for Vietnam electricity had, had kind of been cut off. And so there's a bit more competition in the sector. Um, and so India is something that we forget was very socialist in terms of its system pre-1990, really. It really only started to become an open up to private business in other areas in, 90, in the early 90s, right? So there's still a lot of state involvement in India as well. Um, so I would say that from that perspective, there's a lot of work to do for, for India. But I think Vietnam can take a step up with its ports. You know, it, the infrastructure is probably going to be better than India. I think the infrastructure is, is already there or it's it's at a much more developed phase than India's. Um, and also its workforce, as I said, it's a young population, but it doesn't have the scale. That's something we have to acknowledge that India has that scale in terms of the population. Um, and in terms of the, uh, in terms of just the, the spending power, maybe potentially in the future, but both both countries, as I said, will 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 benefit. And I think Vietnam can step up as being a really a, a really strong export powerhouse for uh, for brands, both perhaps within uh, the U.S. and also Europe. So I think it has its own unique advantages. Um, next question. Okay, so I think Jake, you covered this a little bit. I don't know, maybe you can just uh, just remind the viewers about ETF fees for Vietnam compared with other ETFs in Singapore uh, that are accessible to to investors. How how do we compare to say some of the other Vietnam ETFs that are in the market for Singapore investors? Um, Carol, there's only one ETF that's listed in Singapore for Singapore investors. Um, if let's say you have access to uh, the Taiwan market, I think the largest ETF out there is called the Fubon uh, Vietnam ETF. Um, but it, it does come cheap as well. The, the management fees is 0.99% as well. So broadly speaking, uh, ETFs in this space, they are not coming cheap. 
Yeah, so the lowest uh, share with everyone comes at 0.5%. Uh, but in terms of uh, accessibility, of course, is, uh, it's accessible if you are able to trade US. It's uh, the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam ETF. Correct. So that comes with a total expense ratio of uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.68%, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, so you definitely will not find any ETFs that, you know, charge, say, uh, below 0.5% uh, all in. Yeah, but of course you are subject to, let's say, uh, FX risk or whatever risk that you could be exposed to, depending on how you route your trades or how you, you route to the market. Yeah. I think, I think it's harder for Vietnam ETFs to be below that sort of 0 0.6, 0 0.5 threshold, just because it's harder to access, right? For That's right. That's as right. Institutional investors, there's a barrier to entry to access the market. Correct. Even for, I'm looking at the, the charges right now, even for local domicile ETFs, you're looking at 0 0.6 being the cheapest. Yeah. 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 Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, so an all in cost would still be around 0 0.8 to 0 0.95 percent around that range, close uh, to a percent. Okay. So yeah, I think we're probably um probably I think we're pretty competitive in that in that space given given how hard it is to access the market. Um okay, so biggest risks investing. I think we can cover these last few ones a bit quicker. Um as we're running out of time. What is the biggest risk investing in Vietnam? I mean, what what would your take be, Jake, in terms of the risks for investors to watch out for? Um, as an investor in that country, I think two key risks, um, regulatory risk, which is if the government were to shut me out one day and, uh, you know, kick me out from accessing the market, that's one. Mm. Um, second would be liquidity risk. Yeah. Even though we have accounted for the uh, foreign ownership limit, um, but the day-to-day -day liquidity, we still have to be very careful. We cannot take things for granted because it's not exactly a free market. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. So these are the two major concerns right now for me. Um, yeah, but of course, yeah, of course, we know that um, the current Vietnamese government is very sensible, very logical. They are not your cowboy style government. We can we can see that, yeah. yeah. So they're definitely not your Kim Jong Il. Yeah, I think it's a bit more consensus driven as well yes. than being a one Correct. leadership. So I think that should hopefully give investors a bit more comfort. Good mind, yeah, comfort. But you're right. I think I think the regulatory side is just something that, given the former government, is probably just a risk anyway, just in case there are certain. It's a risk. Correct. Yeah, so I think that, but but there's there's some caveats to that as well. Um, okay, so next question. Okay, limitation and weakness of Vietnam to diversify and venture to some high tech and advanced industries. How do you think Vietnam will be able to get a breakthrough? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'll just take it quickly. I think Vietnam um, is trying to move further up. We've seen that with solar panels as well. We've seen that with solar uh, generation. So I think there is a there is a potential given its geographical benefits and traits. You know that the, the three thousand two hundred kilometers of coastline, um, the the potential in terms of its ports. I think there's it's always been an export sort of driven economy, and I think given the educational backdrop, that makes it more favorable for them. But there is work to do, as I said, in terms of the practical skills and the university education system as well that needs to work and that needs to be advanced, but there's no reason why they couldn't benefit in this region, given their, uh, given their advantages. Um, Jake, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Um, yeah, in fact, I agree because uh, we, we, we can see that the Vietnamese government actually is very intelligent. And they, they have learned from the Chinese. They have, in fact, they're, they're learning very closely from Singapore. Uh, way of developing the uh, industrialization process. Uh, naturally, they will move up the value chain. It's part of the plan, if you can see what they've been doing right now. Uh, 
Um, mm. Of course, yeah, the, the, the tailwind is definitely the focus on, on education. And because one, of, because one of the bad and good thing about having a communist government, right, um, if you are agnostic towards any political views, um, it, it does have certain benefits when it comes to having uh, a communist government because you can direct your resources, you can direct all the efforts in a very uh, channeled fashion rather than having a democracy like India, mm. when you yeah you fight over political interests over national interests. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, the 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 communist part of this of this uh, system actually does help Vietnam very much like China. Uh, but of course we would love Vietnam not to to repeat the footsteps of China, where it takes on excessive leverage until what we, what we see right now. It's yeah. a bit harder for, for China to clean, clean up their, their acts. Uh, it will take some time, but the pain is there. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. definitely. Um, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, okay, so next, next question. Can we, I think we final question. All right, Singapore has surpassed South Korea to become the biggest source of FDI for Vietnam. But with high concentration only a few industries, which shows it shows the limitation and weakness of Vietnam to diversify. Um, I think I guess this is some more maybe perhaps more of a statement, but alludes to the the the, the concentration with with perhaps the sectors and the, the the moving up the value chain. I would just say that as Jake pointed out, you know, it takes time to to, for the manufacturing base and for also the, the workforce to move up the value chain. I mean, we've seen that from say 10 years ago, 15 years ago with clothing and low and textiles and starting to move into, I, you know, we have the manufacturing of, of watches and, and AirPod Pros and other electronics in, in, um, in Vietnam now. And there's Dell and HP and talk about setting up uh, production plants there and Foxconn thinking about setting up production plants as well. So I think it is moving up the value chain. It just takes time and to retool the workforce as well is going to take a bit more time. So there are opportunities that emerge and I think they have the wherewithal and the educated workforce and and the infrastructure that's emerging, but not, not great, but it's the infrastructure there to, to take advantage. And remember that Vietnam, again, is, is just one landmass perhaps similar to Thailand that might be a benefit versus a, a archipelago like Indonesia which is very sprawled out with many islands and same with the Philippines I think Vietnam really benefits from its uh, geographic location as well so I think there's opportunity and there just has to be more um, a bit more of a maybe push as, as Jake said in certain sectors for the government but they're, they're working on that um, Jake do you have anything else to add? Um, as an investor, I like to spread my bets. I, I, I don't expect to find a perfect country to invest in. I don't expect to find a perfect uh, market to invest in. Every market is unique. Um, take Korea, for example. They, they have certain sectors which they are very strong in. But at the same time, it is equally volatile because of its, uh, if its openness, right, in that sense. And also because of its uh, political uh, environment. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. right. So we, we have to weigh how much to allocate to different countries, different regions. Yeah. So this is constantly at the back of our mind when, when it comes to being capital allocators. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Correct. It's easy to, to fall in the trap of, you know, believing in too much narrative, but you never quite. Con consciously manage your risk, right? So to limit your allocation indirectly limits your risk, but at the same time, that if that you're not taking any risk, there's no way to. Yeah. yeah, you gotta have some exposure and a bit of risk to get more of the right. reward, right? So I, I, yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of the countries are very unique. Every, every country in Asia has just got a unique proposition and growth story. I think it just is whether that growth story fits in with your investment, philosophy and your portfolio allocation yeah. yeah okay great uh thanks jake and thank you everybody for joining us and thank you everyone please
do you know uh, join us in future for any other webinars we may have and uh, everyone have a good evening thank you for joining us good night thank you bye, bye.